Thank you very much. And first of all, on behalf of all of us on the panel, um, I want to thank you uh, for including us and including me in particular in this extraordinary symposium. It's an honor to be here, not only because of Turkey's profound historical and modern importance as a bridge between the East and the West, uh, but also because I recognize that this symposium is taking place at a momentous moment in the continuing story of Turkey's modern political and legal development. Um, I am committed to trying to speak slowly uh, so that the translators are able to uh, translate uh, for those of you who are listening in Turkish, uh, but I'm sure I won't manage to actually succeed in doing that. Um, this panel is titled The Rule of Law, and we have presentations on some of the central issues concerning the rule of law from myself uh, and the other three professors on the panel, Professor Richard Fallon of the Harvard Law School, uh, Professor Ergen Ozbedun, I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's Perfectly. My, <laughs> uh, of Istanbul City University, uh, who's also Turkey's representative on the Venice Commission, uh, and Professor Heather Gerken of the Yale Law School. And I'll begin with some opening remarks, then each of the panelists will give their opening remarks. We'll have some discussion among the panel uh, after that, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience. I have spent many years myself studying the design of democratic institutions and the role of constitutional courts within the democratic system. Uh, and when we talk about democratic systems at this point in world history, uh, we are nearly always now talking about constitutional democracies. We live in the age of constitutional democracy. Uh, since the 1980s, we have had more new democracies created than at any moment before in world history. Uh, and all of these new democracies have been created as constitutional democracies. The British model of a pure parliamentary system of democracy uh, without judicial review, uh, without constitutional constraints on the power of the executive and the legislative branches, uh, has not been embraced in any of the post-World War II democracies that have been formed. Um, and indeed, even the United Kingdom uh, has come to accept uh, the Human Rights Act, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and some constraints now uh, on unlimited parliamentary um, sovereignty. And with the dominance of constitutional democracy in the modern era has come ongoing struggles and debates about the proper role of constitutional courts in modern democracy. Uh, a subject the United States has struggled with almost since its very beginnings. The focus of my work has been on the structure of political power in constitutional democracies and the ongoing struggles over the way political power is organized and constrained in constitutional democracies. Uh, and I want to talk about two aspects of that struggle here today. Um, first, what are the underlying understandings or visions or ideas about politics, about society that underlie the way different democratic systems organize political power when they form constitutions initially, creating their basic political structures, and when they struggle over time, as is inevitable, uh, about the development of those structures, the adaptation of those structures uh, to changing circumstances over time. Um, the original ideas behind the design of a country's democratic institutions or the way a country understands its democratic institutions uh, are extremely important uh, to think about and to work through. And to understand these institutions, the specific democratic institutions a particular system has, we need to understand the ideas and understandings that lie behind them. So I want to contrast two visions or understandings of political democracy. 
Uh, one vision is a strongly majoritarian one. And this vision of democracy, the strong majoritarian kind of view of democracy, uh, traces back to, in many ways, Rousseau. Uh, the idea is that democratic societies should be understood to have some kind of general will. And it's the purpose of democratic institutions to enable that general will to govern. And on this understanding of democracy, democratic institutions should be designed and should function to enable the majority to govern, to enable majority rule. This is a very common, widespread view of democracy. Uh, it is a response to the question, what does democracy mean? And for many people, uh, the answer is simply the idea of majority rules. Uh, it's also a view of democracy to which many countries going through democratic transition from an authoritarian past tend to be drawn to. If the prior authoritarian regime had a monopoly on political power, then the democratic uh, transition uh, is taken to mean now it's our turn to exercise that kind of power the majorities, the kind of power the authoritarian state had before the democratic transition. Now I want to contrast this majoritarian view of democracy with the alternative view, and it's an alternative view uh, that is deeply embedded in the institutional design and the structures of democracy in the United States. Uh, and so I want to help uh, explain the contrast reflected in our institutional structures uh, to the pure majoritarian view of democracy. Um, the American system was specifically designed to reject this pure majoritarian vision of what democracy means or what it ought to mean. Um, in the American view, the idea that democracy involves some kind of general will uh, is an idea to be strongly resisted. Um, there is a great risk that such a view, the view of democracy as reflecting a general will, uh, assumes a society with united, unified interests. Uh, even worse, this view runs the danger uh, that challenges to the dominant views, including the views of political majorities, uh, will be seen as efforts to subvert uh, the general will. Uh, the single most important idea, I believe, behind the design of America's democratic institutions, uh, going back to their original design, and it's an idea that I think is not widely appreciated, and even in the United States not widely appreciated, but to me the single most important and significant idea behind the notion of democracy in the United States is that democratic societies should be understood to involve diverse and conflicting um, antagonistic uh, interests and aspirations. Um, democracy doesn't rest, in fact, on a fairly homogenous society. Um, and democracy does not need to rest on a fairly homogenous society or vision of society. Um, even though many Democrats uh, throughout the 19th century including John Stuart Mill, one of the most famous democratic liberal political theorists, believed that democracy could not function except in societies that were extremely homogenous. Uh, but from the very beginning of the American experience, uh, this very strikingly modern view, actually, uh, a view that society necessarily involves conflict, difference, uh, antagonism, antagonisms, um, and that democracy can handle all of that. And the institution should be designed to reflect this much more pluralistic vision of democracy, this less majoritarian vision of democracy. Um, that idea uh, is deeply embedded in the design of America's democratic institutions. Uh, indeed, democratic systems uh, often collapse precisely when majorities are perceived to be running roughshod over the important and intense interests of other groups in the society. 
Uh, the majoritarian vision of democracy can be a considerably less stable vision uh, of democracy than this more pluralistic vision. Um, so just to give you a, a crude uh, initial description of the design of democratic institutions in the United States, uh, the key idea in this design was that political power should be diffused, spread out, distributed over a range of different political institutions rather than being concentrated in one centralized national political institution. Uh, the great fear was that centralizing political power in one set of national institutions uh, ran the risk that democratic politics could be captured by one set of temporarily dominant political forces or a political party. Uh, and so, so to avoid that risk of capture in our system, political power was first diffused or spread between national institutions and state and local institutions uh, with the decentralization of political power uh, and meaningful political power being decentralized <laughs> away from the center, away from national institutions as one important form of security uh, against one set of temporarily dominant political forces capturing complete control of the state. Uh, in addition, even within the national political branches of government, there was further distribution and diffusion of political power across institutions. So as you may know, we have a president, a senate, a house of representatives, all of which are elected by different voters, elected under different terms of office, uh, so that it's not possible in the United States in one election for one set of political forces to capture all of the institutions of power, even at the national level, uh, in just one election. Uh, it typically takes at least three election cycles or a period of six years or so uh, for a sustained dominant political majority to be able to capture control of those institutions at the national level. Um, and all of this, it's part of what we call our system of checks and balances, uh, is designed with this pluralistic conception of democracy informing these structures. Uh, and of course, the very idea of constitutional democracy is one of the most important of these checks and balances on concentrated uh, political power. Uh, but once democracies are formed, there's a constant struggle to sustain these institutions. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of the inevitable risks all democratic systems face is the risk that brings me to my second point about a perspective from outside on the struggles over democratic political institutions. Um, in every democratic system, there is the inherent risk of what I call uh, authoritarianism within democratic regimes emerging and capturing control of state institutions. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there is an inevitable tendency in all democracies, including well-established democracies and fragile, more newly formed democracies, that those who manage to gain political power legitimately through the election process will seek to take that power and entrench themselves more deeply in office. They will seek in various ways, through various forms, uh, to use the power they now have and leverage it into more deeply entrenched power through trying to suppress various forces of political competition or other kinds of challenges uh, to their political rule. Uh, they will seek perhaps to manipulate the rules of the election process to make it more difficult for their opponents to engage in meaningful political competition and challenge. Uh, they will seek perhaps to subordinate uh, other independent institutions in the system to their poli particular political will 
and political preferences um, and agendas. Um, and in fact, this is one of the things we are now seeing happening around the world. As I said at the beginning, we are living in the age of constitutional democracy, and we have had a flourishing uh, for the first 15 years or so after the fall of the Soviet Union of new democracies. But we've also had very significant retrenchment from democracy that has been going on since roughly 2005 um, in many democracies uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, uh, Freedom House, for example, which is one of the organizations that rates democracies, uh, has found that uh, in the last five to ten years, uh, there has been more movement away from democracy across the world than in any previous similar period of time. Um, to the extent that Western societies are complacent about democracy, as I think we sometimes are, uh, to the extent we believe democracy is maybe inevitable or the forces of modernity will inevitably push democracy forward, or that once democracies are established, they will be sustainable, um, that's a serious historical mistake uh, that Western complacency um, can make. Uh, and even in countries that were held up as models of democracies or newer democracies uh, 10 years ago, uh, such as Hungary or Mexico, uh, we have seen very significant uh, retrenchments um, from democracy. Now, the forms of retrenchment and the forms of dominant powers seeking to capture control of state institutions to enhance their power uh, can take many shapes. Uh, sometimes we have genuine democracies, but they are controlled by one political party over a sustained period of time. Uh, that's not because that party has manipulated the rules to get into power. Uh, I think of South Africa, for example, and the uh, ANC uh, as the party of liberation and then the party of government that has been a one-party dominating source of power ever since South Africa's independence. Um, one-party states, nonetheless, even that, though that they have one party uh, in effect, also uh, exhibit these tendencies of those in power to try to further enhance and entrench themselves in power through legal changes that make it more difficult for their potential opponents uh, to resist uh, or challenge them very effectively. Uh, but also in multi-party democracies, including in the United States, this same inevitable tendency to suppress competition, to suppress challenge, to entrench oneself in power uh, has been visible. Uh, let me give you one very powerful example from the history of the United States. Uh, in the middle of the 20th century, or in the 1930s in the United States, uh, we had a very substantial struggle between our president and our Supreme Court uh, over central political issues uh, of the day. Um, and I'm referring here to a controversy involving the efforts by President Franklin Roosevelt, who was one of our most popular and one of our greatest presidents, uh, in my view, uh, but who nonetheless tried to take over control of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, by changing the laws uh, for how the justices of the court were appointed. Uh, at this moment in our history, our court uh, was issuing decisions that were hostile to his policy agenda. Uh, and he was the most popular president at this point in American political history. Still to this day, he won office with more of a landslide vote of support uh, at this moment in our history than any president before or since. Uh, now, the Supreme Court because we have life tenure for our judges, which, by the way, I consider to be a mistake, uh, and I think that leaves people in office for too long. Uh, I prefer a system where judges are appointed for a term of office. Uh, but we had justices who had been serving for many decades on our court uh, and who 
consistently rejected the very popular ev efforts of President, President Roosevelt uh, to bring about a more active state role in regulating the economy in the United States. Uh, and he decided that he had to break the court or bend it to his will. Uh, and he came up with a proposal that for every justice on the court who was over the age of 70, uh, he should be entitled, with the passage of a new law, to appoint a new justice. Not to remove people from the court, uh, but to add a new justice for everyone over the age of 70. And even though these decisions of our court were not popular decisions, and even though this was the most popular president in American history, um, when he said, I need to have this power because these justices are getting old and they can't keep up with all of the work of the court, uh, this was his reason for making this change. Uh, it was widely understood that this was a pretext for him trying to gain political control of the court. Uh, and so there was a tremendous backlash against these efforts, even of a very popular president with an unpopular court. Now the mechanisms of this backlash involve things like the Supreme Court itself defending its independence by going before political bodies and defending the independence of the court. It involved the legal community and the academic community rallying very strongly behind the independence of the court. It involved the political opposition in, in government rallying very strongly behind the court. Uh, and ultimately, in the United States, the president lost this battle. Uh, he did not get these changes developed. Uh, but even more importantly, in fighting this battle, he very significantly undermined his political authority and his legitimacy and his credibility. And he was unable, after this battle, to enact many of the ideas in his political program because he had so destroyed his credibility by seeming to try to take over the court um, that it was a significant political setback. Um, that's just to say, as one example, that all democratic systems face these kinds of struggles between those who are in power uh, and the forces uh, that seek to challenge that power. Uh, so, uh, in my view, uh, the message I would like to convey here is there are two very different ways of understanding democracy and democratic institutions uh, that we need to be mindful of. The sort of majoritarian or pure majoritarian vision of democracy, which has a kind of popular and intuitive appeal, versus the more pluralistic vision of democracy, that is reflected in the design of many democratic systems, particularly in the United States. Um, secondly, the risk that all democratic systems inevitably face the prospect that those who temporarily are in power will seek to entrench and themselves and reduce the checks and constraints on their power. Uh, that among the most important institutions in resisting this inevitable tendency are the institutions of an independent judiciary, though not just those institutions. Uh, but at the end of the day, the power of the courts in ultimate confrontations with the political branches uh, depends on something other than just the institutional struggle between the two branches or the two institutions. Uh, it depends on where public opinion gets mobilized in support of which of these institutions in these struggles. Uh, it depends on organized and effective interests that are mobilized to protect, for example, the independence and integrity of the courts. And the legal community in particular, in most countries, and certainly in the United States, uh, is often one of the key sources, along with the academic community, uh, in mobilizing public opinion to protect judicial independence and judicial integrity in these very high stakes, highly charged confrontations
between the executive and legislative branches of government uh, and the judicial branch of government in the service of protecting a more pluralistic vision of democracy as a whole. So that's where I'm going to stop for now. Uh, I'm now going to uh, turn to Professor Richard Fallon uh, of the Harvard Law School for his comments. Uh, I wanted to just mention that Professor Fallon is one of the leading authorities in the world on questions involving the rule of law, uh, as well as American constitutionalism and the American federal court system. So, Professor Fallon. Oh. <laughs> So I want to begin by thanking Professor Pildes for uh, that very generous introduction. And even more than that, I want to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, which is at this point already one of the great exciting uh, events of my uh, professional and intellectual life. Uh, it was my great privilege to come to Turkey for the first time in 1976. Uh, when I came in 1976, I absolutely fell in love uh, with this beautiful, beautiful country uh, and its magnificent culture. Uh, I have always wanted to come back, and I could not be more thrilled to be back uh, here today under the current circumstances. Coming back under the current circumstances, though, for me, is a very humbling uh, experience, and it's a very humbling experience in the following way. Uh, I, for a number of years, have studied the rule of law from an academic perspective. Uh, but coming to a place where debates about the rule of law are currently at the very center of political uh, life gives me a sense I frankly wish that I didn't have uh, of how very little it may be uh, that pure academic theorists have to contribute to people who are trying to figure out the best and most appropriate way to go forward in establishing a more robust vision or version of the rule of law uh, than they already have. And so what I am going to do in my remarks is I think what academics do under circumstances such as these, uh, and that is to try to clarify some of the concepts that are uh, in issue uh, and maybe to clarify uh, how much more uh, it is is necessary beyond an academic understanding of the rule of law uh, is it's necessary to have in order for a country to establish a robust rule of law culture uh, and so my remarks are going to fall into three uh, parts uh, first I'm going to talk about the nature of the rule of law as a political ideal uh, then, second, I'm going to talk about what I will call the cultural uh, preconditions for the rule of law. Uh, and then, third and finally, I will talk about some of the challenges uh, in creating the right uh, cultural conditions uh, for a robust version of the rule uh, of law, moving to those right uh, cultural conditions from ones uh, in which the situation is somehow more fluid or more fragile. Uh, so first, with respect to the nature of the rule of law as a political ideal, uh, there is a vast, vast literature on this uh, subject, uh, and I am going to spare you a detailed review of most of it, uh, but I will begin, I guess, by emphasizing that uh, in the vast uh, literature, there seem to be just two areas of agreement. Uh, first, the, there is wide agreement that at a minimum, uh, the rule of law uh, requires that most of the people in a society should be ruled by law and that there should be some limits as well on the government and government officials. Uh, a situation where the government claimed to rule by divine uh, right or even a situation uh, in which the government claimed to be able 
to rule pursuant to the will of the majority, unchecked by anything but the will of the majority, would not be a rule of law regime. There have to be some uh, limits on the government as well uh, as on individual citizens. Uh, and then the second point of agreement among theorists about the rule of law uh, is that the existence of the rule of law is typically a matter of degree. Uh, it is not ordinarily a situation uh, where some societies have it, other societies don't. Uh, we can talk about how closely any particular society approaches the rule of law ideal or how far uh, any particular society deviates from the rule of law uh, ideal, but we have to understand that we're in a domain where there is no perfection and virtually everything happens uh, along a spectrum. Against the background of that agreement, the big disagreement among uh, rule of law theorists involves the question whether all that is necessary for the existence of the rule of law uh, is for most of the people to be ruled by law and for the government to be subject to some uh, legal constraints on the one hand or on the other hand, uh, whether the idea of the rule of law has built into it some other political values or desiderata, uh, such as equality or uh, justice or respect for human diversity uh, and human dignity. With respect to this division, I think the thing that is necessary uh, to keep in mind from start to finish, to have an understanding of what the debate is about, is that the people on both sides of this debate uh, recognize that the idea of the rule of law will frequently do more to organize than to resolve political conflict. Uh, and the a debate is about how people would best understand uh, the rule of law in order to understand those things that people are understandably naturally in political conflict about. Uh, so, for example, if somebody takes the minimal view of the rule of law, all that's necessary uh, for the rule of law is for the citizenry to be ruled by law and for the government to be subject to some legal restraints. It is not because somebody thinks that every regime that satisfies these criteria is a good regime. On the contrary, people will say, who take this view, the rule of law is just one political ideal among many, and I can imagine a number of situations in which other political ideals are more important than the rule of law. Uh, if you're in a sufficiently unjust regime, if people are in a sufficiently uh, unjust regime, whether it's a slave regime such as once existed uh, in the United States or an apartheid uh, regime such as once existed in South Africa, uh, there may be the rule of law in some minimal sense, but the right thing to do may be to take up arms, to go into the streets in protest against the existing uh, rule of law in order to establish a more uh, just regime. Uh, for somebody who takes the more encompassing, what theorists often refer to uh, as a thick conception of the rule of law that conceptualizes the rule of law as involving justice and equality and so uh, forth, uh, conflict doesn't go away, rather conflict tends to get subsumed under the heading of the rule of law uh, so that if you are committed to the rule of law but if you live in a regime where there is law and order on the one hand uh, but also a good deal of unfairness or injustice on the other hand and you want to know what respect for the rule of law impels you to do then right within the ideal of the rule of law, uh, there may be room for debate or disagreement about whether respect for the rule of law means staying home and adhering to the dictates of established authorities or rising up in protest to insist that the injustice that coexists with relative law and order is simply 
intolerable uh, under the ideal of the rule of law. The point that I mean to make as I finish this first part uh, of my remarks about the nature of the rule of law is that it is easy to talk about the rule of law, but reference to the rule of law very much more often invites further political debate uh, than it serves to settle uh, political debates that are currently underway. Second uh, thing that I want to talk about uh, briefly involves the cultural preconditions for a relatively thick or what I would think of as robust conception of the rule of law, a situation in which there's not only uh, minimal order but justice and equality and a uh, desirable political regime. Interestingly, there are a number of efforts by experts of different kinds to rate countries in the world uh, in terms of how well they do according to a so-called rule of law uh, index. Uh, and I think we can learn something about the cultural preconditions for a successful rule of law regime by looking at both the top and the bottom of the most recent uh, index re released uh, by uh, the International Justice Project. Uh, so if one looks at the countries that are worst on the rule, l l let me start actually at the other end. Let me start with the countries that do best. Uh, at the top end are predictably uh, the liberal regimes from North America and Europe, but especially uh, the regimes from Scandinavia. Uh, so in the most recent rankings, uh, number one ranked in the world is Denmark, followed by uh, Sweden, uh, followed by Finland. Um, but the top four or five regimes are all uh, located in Scandinavia. Uh, if one asks what these countries have in common, uh, they're all relatively prosperous, they're all uh, relatively politically liberal and homogeneous, uh, and then I think in some ways maybe most important, they all have traditions against the backgrounds of which people reasonably expect that government officials will uh, be transparent and will conduct their affairs in accordance with law. If one looks at the bottom, uh, there's a much more mixed uh, lot, uh, including Venezuela, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, uh, Pakistan, Cameroon, Bolivia, and Nigeria. Uh, if one asks what these regimes have in common, uh, they would include poverty, traditions of colonialism, um, deep ethnic or religious divisions uh, and traditions of exploitation of governmental power by those who possess it for purposes of personal or group advantage. When lawyers think about the rule of law and how to inst institute uh, rule of law regimes, they almost invariably think of institutional reforms, bills of rights, separations of powers, independent judiciaries, things uh, of this kind. Uh, I asked you to start thinking about these uh, issues in terms of countries that are at the very top and at the very bottom of the rule of law index for purposes of asking you to imagine what would happen if somebody took the Danish constitution and Danish political institutions uh, and simply inserted them uh, into one of the 10 countries at the bottom of the rule of law uh, index uh, with their poverty, uh, their deep ethnic and religious divisions and their traditions of exploitation of governmental power for personal and group advantage. And my strong expectation is that the formal institutions would do no good. Uh, that people who came from a tradition of exploiting government for purposes of personal and group advantage uh, would go right on uh, exploiting government for purposes of personal and group advantage, uh, taking advantage of every loophole that was available uh, to them. So I think cultural conditions are often much more important than formal institutions to establishing 
the kind of rule of law regime that we would all like to live uh, in. If there is pertinence to Turkey here, and I'm not informed enough to know confidently uh, that there is. But if there is pertinence to Turkey here, it would seem to me that the pertinence involves culture rather than written constitution. Uh, as a constitutional lawyer looking at the Turkish constitution, it looks to me to be fine, it looks to me uh, to be serviceable, it doesn't look to me uh, to be so terribly different from uh, that of the countries that rate highest in the world on a rule of law uh, index. Uh, if there is a problem here, and again I'm not saying that there is, it is a cultural one. Uh, involving attitudes that go beyond those that can be captured in any written constitutional text. When I say attitudes that go beyond any written constitutional text, what I have in mind uh, is that no constitutional text is perfect, no constitutional text can anticipate every eventuality that might arise or every way in which government might excuse me, might go wrong. Um, and in those situations that aren't and can't be provided for, uh, even by the best constitutions, what is required is a kind of spirit of temperance and willingness to live with what some people refer to as the spirit of a constitution uh, rather than its uh, letter. Uh, and it is this concern about establishing a spirit of constitutionalism concerned with living uh, with the spirit of a constitution and not uh, just its letter that brings me briefly uh, to the very last thing that I want uh, to talk about, which is the challenge of creating the right constitutional and cultural conditions for a robust, attractive version of the rule of law uh, when they don't already exist. There's a good deal of writing about this uh, subject among political theorists. The political theorists tend to divide into two camps. Uh, one camp of political theorists is substantially positive. Uh, they are concerned uh, not with what ought to be done, but with what happens uh, in the world. And many of the people in this camp uh, say that the cultural conditions for a robust version of the rule of law come about only when there are competing powerful constituencies, all of which thinks that its interests will best be served in the long run by constitutional democracy, respect for human rights, and an independent prosecutorial system and an independent judicial system, expecting that there will be times when they are out of power as well as when they are in power, uh, and that it will be to their long-term advantage to have uh, an institutional in independent judiciary operating with relatively even hands when they are out uh, of power. In so far as there is something like a prevailing social compact among powerful constituencies uh, believing that rule of law institutions work to their own long-term self-advantage as well as those of others, uh, then what these political scientists predictably say will happen in situations of perceived overreaching uh, is that there will be a counter-reaction from other forces making known their desire, their will, their potential political power if the situation comes where they need to exercise uh, their political power, hoping through mobilization of popular energy and so uh, forth to exist, to exert a kind of checking uh, function uh, that will help to sustain the rule of law in the long run. One of the striking things about this school of political theorists is that they're not terribly normative. Uh, they are not concerned to describe uh, the appropriate behaviors or attitudes of those who currently have political power. Uh, they only want to maintain that through a somewhat self-interested 
uh, system of checks and balances of uh, power, it is possible for strong, robust rule of law cultures to sustain themselves. The other uh, group of political theorists is substantially normative. Uh, and what these uh, theorists want to emphasize is that in the long run, for there to be successful, robust uh, rule of law, people have to have the right attitudes. Uh, and then if you ask what are the right attitudes, uh, then the two attitudes that would be emphasized most frequently would be the attitudes of reasonableness and of trust. Uh, and when I said at the beginning that I find it very humbling in my role as a constitutional lawyer uh, to be here, I have no expertise uh, in the arts of developing reasonableness and developing trust, but I am totally convinced uh, that these are perhaps the most vital uh, arts in establishing a successful rule of law that people would be happy with in the long run uh, in any political society. So just a few words about reasonableness. Uh, the basic idea of reasonableness, I think, is that people from every uh, group have to look at situations not only from their own point uh, of view but from those in other positions and to ask uh, how would I wish to be treated, when would I think that I was being treated fairly and when would I think I was being uh, treated unfairly if I were in the position of a political minority rather than a political uh, majority uh, and with people taking this general perspective on reasonableness, then reasonableness in government implies or necessitates restraint. It's not pushing to the bounds, it's not uh, taking advantage of political power to the extent that democracy or uh, in place political regimes will permit uh, one to take advantage of the levers of power. It is maintaining the kind of uh, reasonable restraint in the exercise of political power uh, that would leave the majority reasonably satisfied when it was in the minority. The other crucial political virtue uh, it seems to me, is the virtue of trust, because if you don't trust your political opponents, uh, then why, under any circumstances, would you restrain yourself from exercising power uh, when you've got it? Uh, and it seems to me in a variety of situations across the world, I don't know enough about Turkey to say uh, that this is true uh, here, but in a variety of situations across the world, the absolutely most crucial step that needs to be taken to cultivating the kind of rule of law with which we all ought to be happy uh, is the virtue of trust and I don't know how to build uh, trust and I think that beyond looking uh, to lawyers and economists, people who care about the rule of law everywhere uh, ought to be looking to and for bridge builders who are experts uh, in trust uh, building. With that confession, about the incapacity to some extent of international lawyers, I think, to tell you what you would most uh, like to do. Uh, I will finish with a kind of uh, cry from the heart. Uh, and the cry from the heart uh, is focused on the paradigm of a situation that appears in many places uh, throughout the world. Uh, where political leaders under conditions uh, in which the atmosphere for the rule of law is fraught or fragile, uh, put the kind of trust that is necessary for the existence of the rule of law at risk uh, either uh, by changing the rules of political democracy as Professor Pildes has talked uh, about or using levers of power to initiate baseless prosecutions or tampering uh, with the judicial branch uh, in a way that tends to squander the society's rule of law uh, heritage or to betray the kind of trust uh, that is necessary for the rule of law's uh, flowering. Uh, for political leaders to behave that way anywhere uh, in the world is both a political tragedy and a moral crime. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And our next speaker will be Professor Osbedon. Uh, I assume he needs uh, no real introduction uh, here to all of you. Uh, but I wanted to say that he has been my main guide to understanding the history of Turkey's constitutional and political system. Uh, I've read recently two of his important books, The Constitutional System of Turkey uh, and his book, Islamism, Democracy and Liberalism. And I've learned an enormous amount from those works, which seem to me full of insight. So I'm very happy to be able to participate here with him. And I turn the floor over now to Professor Osbedon. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pildes, for this extremely kind remarks. Uh, I also want to start by thanking the organizers of this uh, very interesting symposium, very interesting and very timely. Uh, I feel uh, pleased and honored to be a participant in this activity. And also I want to congratulate the organizers for the excellent organization and wonderful hospitality. I said timely because the timing is also excellent. Uh, because in those days uh, we are uh, uh, vividly discussing and debating the questions related to the rule of law, judicial review, uh, and some of the dangers that uh, Professor Pildes has pointed out, the majoritarian drift. I'll come back to that a little later. However, let's start uh, with the basic concept, the rule of law. Very briefly and very simply, the rule of law is a system where all acts and actions of the administrative authorities are bound by law. They have to be in conformity with laws. And that conformity has to be reviewed by independent judicial authorities. As such, uh, the rule of law satisfies a very basic human need a need for uh, security, certainty, and predictability. In other words, the rule of law protects individuals against the arbitrary action of the state authorities. As such, historically speaking, the rule of law uh, predated constitutionalism and uh, constitutional democracy. Uh, the first written constitutions in the world were the constitutions of the United States and uh, 1791 constitution of uh, France. Uh, however, even before that, some elements of the rule of law existed in some more fortunate parts of the world. A famous anecdote, if I am allowed to tell you, uh, a conversation between uh, Friedrich the Great, the king of Prussia and the owner of a windmill, uh, Friedrich uh, was traveling around his country. He saw a beautiful hilltop. He liked the place, uh, place very much. On top of the hill, there was a windmill. He, he wanted to own that place and uh, probably to build a summer palace or something. But uh, the owner of, of the windmill uh, an old peasant refused to sell. Uh, Friedrich got angry and he said, I can, uh, don't you know I am the king of this country, I can take it by force. The man said, uh, the old man, but there are judges in Berlin. So even before the end of the 18th century, there were judges in Berlin and in some other fortunate parts of the world. Then uh, came a wave of constitutionalism uh, uh, in many countries in Europe during the uh, 19th century, following the American and French examples. They were basically based on the principle of the separation of powers, uh, the separation of the legislative, executive, and judicial powers that was seen is the main instrument of constitutionalism and main guarantee for maintaining the rights and freedoms of the individuals. 
with the passage of time, uh, especially in parliamentary systems, uh, the separation between the legislature and the executive uh, became less meaningful uh, because the logic of the parliamentary system encourages a fusion or at least a close cooperation between the two bodies. The best example is uh, probably the British example, the Westminster type of democracy, uh, which is in the nature of a parliamentary governmental system. But whatever the system of government, the independence of the judiciary is the remaining pillar of the separation of powers. Without an independent judiciary, we cannot speak uh, of a constitutional democracy or even a constitutional system. And by independence, we mean uh, a body which is not subject to the pressures of the political bodies, the especially, especially the legislative authorities. Again, historically speaking, uh, the first stage in the development of the rule of law was to establish judicial control over the acts of the administration. That could be done in either one of the two ways, uh, is in the Anglo-American system a single judiciary or in the French and continental type with a separate administrative uh, justice in addition to general justice, general courts. Both systems are quite compatible with the rule of law in principle as long as the administrative judges also enjoy the same tenure guarantees and independence vis-à-vis uh, -vis the executive authorities. Uh, the French Conseil d'État was the first uh, prototype, so to speak, but uh, early enough it was also imitated by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Council of State, modeled on the French uh, Conseil d'État, goes back to 1867, so it is a history of uh, almost a century and a half. Uh, another development uh, took place uh, with the introduction of the uh, judicial review of constitutionality of laws. That was a very important step. And we owe this to uh, the American experience uh, to the famous Supreme Court decision Marbury versus Madison in 1803. But it took a lot of time for that model to be adopted in continental Europe and elsewhere in the world. Uh, again, as uh, Professor Pildes mentioned, for a long time in continental Europe, uh, the dominant theory was the general will and uh, the assumption that the elected legislature was the representative of the general will. I remember a very famous uh, French textbook which carries the title uh, La loi uh, comme l'expression générale de l'expression de la volonté générale. The law is the expression of the general will. If it is so, and if you believe, like Rousseau did, in the infallible nature of the general will, then uh, quite naturally you don't feel the need for a, a judicial review of the constitutionality of laws, uh, because a law equals the expression of general will. Certainly this is not our notion of democracy these days. Our notions of democracy uh, is far from such extremely majoritarian notions. However, as I said, it took some time uh, for the uh, judicial review of constitutionality to take uh, root in Europe. Between the two wars, only three relatively smaller countries in Europe, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and the short-lived Spanish Republic experimented with it. 
but all three examples were short-lived. Uh, Austria and uh, Czechoslovakia were annexed by the Nazi Empire, and Spanish uh, Republic collapsed, of course, with the Civil War. But the real wave started uh, after the Second World War, uh, with the establishment of constitutional courts in uh, Germany and Italy in their post-war democratic constitutions. French joined the group uh, with the Fifth Republic by the establishment of Conseil Constitutionnel. And Turkey was one of the earlier European countries with the, the Constitution of 1961. We established the Constitutional Court and for more than uh, half a century it has been an important part of uh, Turkish political and legal system. Especially with the third wave of democratization, as uh, my former mentor uh, Sam Huntington called it, uh, this uh, constitutional courts spread it over almost all parts of Europe, uh, adopted by new democracies, and also in some other parts of the world, Asia, Latin America, uh, even in some Middle Eastern countries. Uh, so. Today, uh, we consider uh, judicial review of constitutionality uh, more or less as an indispensable element of constitutional democracy and the rule of law. Because without it, the supremacy of the constitution becomes an empty slogan with no practical importance. I'll give you one example from our constitutional history. Uh, the first Republican Constitution of uh, 1924 uh, was a rigid constitution. Uh, it had to be a constitutional amendment had to be adopted by two-thirds majority. And the constitution contained uh, a very strong statement about the superiority of the constitution, saying that no laws can be against constitution in any event. However, without judicial review, without a real judicial remedy, uh, many, many laws uh, were adopted by the Grand National Assembly, uh, which were uh, in conflict with the Constitution. So, it is not enough uh, to declare the supremacy of the Constitution for a real constitutional democracy. You have to have a real remedy, a real instrument, and that is the judicial review of constitutionality. For the rule of law to carry a real political meaning, and there I agree with uh, Professor Fallon that uh, it is not only a matter of uh, written regulations, but also uh, a matter of culture of the country, especially political and legal culture. But at any rate, uh, for uh, the rule of law and for the independence of the judiciary uh, to become effective, we need uh, certain additional institutions. It is one thing to declare uh, the rule of law as one of the supreme characteristics of your constitution. It is also quite possible for a constitution uh, to declare the independence of the judiciary in very lofty terms. Again, an example from our uh, 1924 constitution, it considered the judiciary as a separate power. Uh, it uh, talked about its independence. It said that uh, even the Grand National Assembly or the Council of Ministers cannot change or amend or delay any court decision. These were very good principles, of course. But then, uh, the institutions, such as the uh, tenure of the judges or an independent uh, uh, autonomous uh, high judicial council, to take care of the uh, 
personnel matters for judges were lacking. Uh, th therefore, all these uh, principles remained as empty slogans. And throughout that period, both single party years and uh, even after the transition uh, to a multi party system in mid 40s, uh, the judiciary remained uh, under the authority and influence of the uh, executive branch, the Minister of Justice and the uh, Council of Ministers in general. Uh, because uh, there was no institution, no independent institution uh, that would be responsible for career decisions of judges. Again, uh, this was a very crucial uh, defect, so to speak. And uh, the 61 Constitution, just as it created a constitutional court, it also created a high council of uh, judges and public prosecutors. The same system more or less continued uh, with the current constitution of 1982. Within the remaining three minutes or so, uh, let me go back uh, to the point uh, very rightly raised by Professor Pildes, the danger of a majoritarian drift in a democracy. The effort of a majoritarian party, especially a predominant party, uh, to take control of the other state institutions, to dominate them, uh, in a way to eliminate the instruments of what we call in uh, political science literature, instruments of uh, uh, horizontal accountability. This is, unfortunately, I am sorry to say, but uh, we seem to be facing in Turkey nowadays. And it's a very ironical, a bitterly ironical fact that uh, very important reforms with regard to the independence of the judiciary uh, were made with the constitutional amendment of 2010. The amendments were adopted by the votes of the deputies belonging to the majority party, AKP. Uh, the structure of the uh, Supreme Council of Judges and uh, Public Prosecutors was made more pluralistic, more representative of the judiciary as a whole. The role of the Minister of Justice was reduced more or less to a symbolic and representative role. And we all supported uh, these reforms uh, as serving the independence of the judiciary and serving the ends of uh, constitutional democracy. Now the ironical and, uh, yes, I am finishing. Uh, the regrettable fact is that uh, the current majority party seems to be in fight with the institutions it itself created or at least reshaped. Uh, there is a tendency or at least a talk about uh, changing the structure of the High Council of Judges, uh, increasing the role of the Minister of Justice, uh, probably changing the structure of the Constitutional Court itself. At the moment, uh, these are all matters of political debate. Uh, I am not going into detail. Uh, unless you change the Constitution, of course, uh, you won't be able uh, to change the system so radically. And at the moment, the governing party is short of the uh, requisite majority for amending the Constitution. If there are questions, I'll be pleased to answer. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our last uh, presenter is Professor Heather Gerken. Uh, I mentioned she's a professor of law at the Yale Law School, uh, but also an expert on legal issues concerning democracy and the democratic process, as well as constitutional law. Uh, and the author of a book called The Democracy Index, uh, which actually tried to measure the differences between how democratic different states in the United States are uh, and how well they actually run the election system. So with that, uh, let me turn the floor over to Professor Gherkin.
Thank you very much, and good morning. I wanted to begin both by thanking our hosts for their extraordinary graciousness, but also thanking the lawyers uh, in the room, and because for the first time in a long time, I've been inspired uh, by what lawyers do. Uh, lawyers in the United States don't often inspire. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you for reminding me that we are part of an honorable profession. So my comments will be largely thematic. Uh, when you're fourth in line in baseball, it's called batting cleanup in the United States. In an effort to bat cleanup, I'm going to provide some larger themes of frame or vocabulary for talking about many of the issues that we spoke of today, particularly the relationship between formal and informal institutions, between constitutions and culture. Although I think I'll be talking about those questions at a lower level of generality than Professor Fallon, who's talking about culture writ large and looking to the more granular examples of resistance and the fight for the rule of law at, at the level that Professor Pildes was talking about earlier. Now, all law professors must begin with definitions, so I will begin with mine. If we are talking about the rule of law, we should draw a distinction between the rule of law and what one theorist calls the rule by law. The rule of law refers to a predictable and just set of institutional arrangements in which law is administered in a fair and dependable fashion. Law, on this account, is a tool that protects its people. Rule by law refers to a system in which law furthers the ends of the state or its leaders, and in this system, law may not be administered fairly or dependably. It may even become a tool of oppression, a sword rather than a shield for its people. The reason for the distinction is clear. Formal institutions and law exist to protect citizens, but they can also be used to further the ends of power. Put differently, as I think everyone on the panel agrees, the mere existence of formal institutions and formal law does not guarantee a robust, well-functioning democracy. Now, you might think that I am making a mistake here by grouping together laws and institutions when talking about how to preserve the rule of law. As Darrell Levinson points out, however, while everyone is familiar with the idea that law and constitutions can be what we call parchment barriers to those in power, people tend to assume that institutions are what convert parchment barriers into real ones. But while institutions often play a role in doing so, we must remember, as Levinson reminds us, that those in power can ignore institutions just as they ignore rights. Take judicial review. The existence of a judiciary, even one vested with the formal power of judicial review, does not guarantee the rule of law. Those in power can ignore, bypass, or even co-opt the judiciary, just as they can ignore, bypass, or even co-opt a constitutional guarantee. Institutions are essential to a well-functioning democracy but they are a necessary condition, not a sufficient one. And that leads me to what I think is the central puzzle in constitutional theory. How do we convert parchment barriers into real ones? How do we convert textual guarantees into actual guarantees? How do we ensure that rights talk is more than empty rhetoric? Although this is the central question in constitutional law, it is one that actually does not get a lot of attention from constitutional theory, at least American ones. Now maybe that's because our parchment barriers have become real ones in the United States. As a result, we spend a lot of time identifying the conditions necessary to satisfy the rule of law, but not enough time identifying the means by which we achieve those conditions in the first place. It's thus with some trepidation that I enter into this conversation. Nevertheless, I've done a lot of work on what I think of as the great weakness of American constitutional system, 
which is our election system. There, the interests of those in power play an outsized role. There, we lack the formal institutions that most developed democracies use to administer their systems. There, we do not have enough or powerful enough hard law guarantees to protect the precious right to vote. There, we can also find a great deal of guidance on how robust, well-functioning institutional cultures developed. So I'm going to offer a few lessons today that draw from this part of my work, all of which focus on converting parchment barriers into real ones and developing institutions sufficiently robust to withstand the political winds. But I should emphasize from the beginning, consistent with Professor Fallon's modesty, that these may or may not be useful lessons outside of this context, particularly where the stakes are as high as they are in other places. So the first thing one notices when constitutional lawyers talk about the rule of law is that they largely focus on formal institutions and hard or formal law. And they neglect informal institutions and what I will call soft law. Soft law is a term that refers to norms and practices that knit together, for example, government officials, or members of a, of a profession, or even members of a society. They may or may not be written down or publicly enforced, but they powerfully shape behavior, and they place limits on what those in power can and cannot do. It is often informal institutions and soft law that make the rule of law real, that convert parchment barriers into real ones. A country from afar might look like it adheres to the rule of law because it possesses the right kinds of formal institutions and hard law. But unless a robust set of informal norms and practices grow around these formal institutions, unless hard law is buttressed by soft law, unless constitutional guarantees are buttressed by a constitutional culture, then the country may be ruled by law but it does not abide by the rule of law. One needs to focus on the interactions between formal institutions and informal ones, between hard law and soft law in thinking about the rule of law. So the question is, why do parchment barriers ever become real, as long as those in power, if they so choose, can ignore them? Why do formal institutions become powerful institutions if those in power can, if they choose, ignore them? Why does soft law matter to the enforcement of hard law? We need to look to sociology and social psychology on the one hand and political science on the other to discover at least a partial answer. Soft law relies in part on an informal source of power, peer pressure. If there's anyone in the room with a child or a teenager, they are familiar with the dark side of peer pressure. But peer pressure actually has strong benefits as well. Peer pressure works because political leaders and everyday citizens are like teenagers and children. They care about what other people think, and they are likely to care most about the opinions of people in their own peer network. Social scientists have done extensive work identifying the ways in which the pressure to conform affects individual behavior. Although peer pressure then is re responsible for ridiculous things, it does serve useful ends in the rule of law context because it sets certain conduct outside of the bounds. Think, for instance, about a small version of this peer pressure, professional groups, accountants, doctors, lawyers, possess a shared set of norms about best practices. And while these norms are often informal, they cabin the range of acceptable behavior. When your professional identity becomes intertwined with particular practices, your own sense that you are doing a good job depends on conforming to those norms. And culture plays that similar role writ large. Now, peer pressure cannot only shape individual behavior, but remarkably enough, it can shape institutional behavior, even the behavior of nation states to adhere to a sort of set of norms they might otherwise eschew. Social science research reveals that despite vast cultural and resource differences among nation states, countries follow often what scientists call 
common models or scripts of what a nation state ought to look like. Mimicry even happens in areas where you think that cultural or economic factors would trump. For instance, strikingly enough, landlocked nations seem to follow global standards when designing their militaries. These forces are so powerful that you will sometimes see a landlocked country with a navy but no port. So two countries with almost no scientists in them will often create science policy review boards to issue ethics reports and give guidance to scientists who do not really live in their country. Our script, in other words, of what constitutes a good nation state tells us not just what to do, but it tells us what we cannot do. There are certain things that are beyond most nation states, things that a great nation state would never do to its own citizens and still have its leaders hold their heads high. That is how soft law works. Institutions imitate each other for roughly the same reasons that individuals do. They are made up, after all, by people. Sociologists tend to emphasize peer pressure and social meaning, the way that a script signals prestige and becomes a model. Leaders want to be leaders of great country, and the world around them provides important signals as to what constitutes a great country. Some parchment barriers, but not all, become powerful, not because constitutional text is sacred, but because we think we should treat constitutional text as sacred. Political science supplies a second answer to the question of how parchment barriers become real ones. Here, the answer has less to do with psychology and self-regard, and more to do with power and self-interest. Formal institutions and hard law, as I said before, are not automatically imbued with power. They can be sidestepped, they can be ignored, but they provide useful sites for those out of power to coalesce and organize. They represent what a political scientist would call a co coordinating device. It is always hard to organize an opposition because your interests will be diffuse and varied. Every opposition needs a rallying cry, a focal point, something concrete to point to as the reason for action. And when those in power bypass formal institutions or ignore hard law, they supply just that type of rallying point for those in the opposition. Better yet, that rallying point serves as a coordination device for a loyal opposition, one that can paint itself as seeking to restore the constitutional order. In doing so, the loyal opposition cements the importance of these constitutional guarantees. Formal institutions then help beget informal ones. Hard law helps beget soft law. Now there's a second way in which formal power and informal power are linked. When a formal institution is created, whether it is a judiciary or an agency, a set of interests begins to coalesce around it and becomes interested in its continued existence. Moreover, formal institutions often create the conditions in which robust institutional norms develop. In effect, they put everybody under the same roof, and they thus create the type of professional and social networks that ease the transmission of shared commitments. That is especially true when those working under the same roof come from the same profession, something that also contributes to shared norms. The creation of a judiciary, for instance, houses together judges and lawyers who, by virtue of regular interaction, often share a robust set of professional norms to which they adhere, even though there is no requirement for them to do so. Now, I recognize this, this is a bit abstract, but let me give you an example, one drawn from the United States. And it has to do with the role that the federal bureaucracy plays in checking executive power. Now, you might think that a bureaucracy that ignores its executive's wishes is lawless. But a properly robust concept of the rule of law, the sort of pluralist concept that Professor Pildes put forward, recognizes that checks and balances are necessary. It recognizes that the will of the majority or the executive ought to be executed with question rather than without question. In the United States, we do not call this a parallel government. We call this pluralism. And we think that it is an appropriate check on an overweening executive power. So why does the bureaucracy matter here? The bureaucracy's power comes from soft law, 
not hard law, unlike the judiciary or the legislature, which is formally vested with the ability to check the executive, the bureaucracy is an internal check and balance built right inside the executive branch. Its role is not written into the Constitution or even into hard law, but it can nonetheless serve that function and be as important as the external and formal separation of powers. So why is that so? Administrative agencies, after all, are formally governed by hard law. As a technical matter, they generally report to the president and are there to carry out his commands. Despite this fact, the executive's bureaucracy plays a role in checking the executive's power. Ask anyone who's worked in the White House and they will tell you one of the biggest obstacles to power is the people working beneath them. Agencies themselves are often united by a shared mission. Moreover, they work with a shared tradition and a robust professional network. That allows them to develop strong norms that can withstand the waves of politics as they crash down upon them. That is why some scholars have even called the civil service in the United States part of the separation of power inside the executive. It is an internal form of the separation of power. And interestingly enough, lawyers have often played a particularly robust role in checking the executive from below. They are, of course, governed by the same norms as other members of their agencies or divisions, but they are also knit together by a professional culture and organized in their capacity as a loyal opposition because of that. They not only have a robust set of shared commitments to draw upon, but they have a re readily available set of coordinating devices, principles around which they can rally when the executive strays too far off course. Now, none of this is to say that the president never gets his way with our bureaucracy. Some self-interest and sheer, sometimes self-interest and sheer power politics win the battle, but it's very hard for self-interest and sheer power politics to win the war in the presence of powerful informal institutions and robust informal norms. I've been especially interested in how these norms are created because I study election law, where, to be frank, we could use more of them, where the bureaucracy that runs elections is not sufficiently robust, does not have a sufficiently powerful set of shared norms to withstand the political winds. And what has become clear to me in my study is that in order to make that professional bureaucracy flourish, in order to have those norms strong enough to withstand political winds, two things matter. First is pressure from the outside. Virtually everyone who is involved in human rights or environmental reform or corruption reform relies on indices. Those rankings do not carry with them the force of law, but they matter. Leaders of nation states want to be leading nation states of greatness, so they care about where they are on those indices. They especially care about where they are relative to their peers because their own self-conception depends on them being ranked on the index where they think they belong. But pressures from the inside matter as well, as is evident from the American president's experience with the administrative bureaucracy and particularly his lawyers. Here again, there is no formal power ceded to these groups and yet they wield power. They do not win every battle, but they prevent the president from winning certain kinds of wars by making it too costly for the president to deviate from certain kinds of practices. As with pressures from the outside, these norms provide coordinating devices for the opposition, and they push some practices outside the pale. The bureaucracy, in effect, tells the president there are some things that he cannot do, and that is a valuable thing in a functioning democracy. I know there's a great deal more to be said and that there are no magic fixes or easy recipes for success. I know that situations vary dramatically from country to country and institution to institution. And I know that sometimes the rule of law fails to take root despite our best efforts. But in thinking about how to nurture the institutions and laws that constitute the rule of law, we should focus not just on formal institutions and hard law, but informal institutions and soft law. We need to focus not just on rights guarantees, but on bureaucratic and professional cultures that preserve them. We should think as much about the internal separation of powers as the external separation of powers. Our picture then of the rule of law
should not be a picture of hard law and formal institutions checking power, but of soft law and infant formal institutions helping strengthen and buttress that effort. Thank you very much. I think we'll have one or two questions uh, among the panelists, and then we'll open it up uh, to the floor for questions. Um, and let me start by directing this question to uh, Professor uh, Osbadan. There was a lot of discussion up here about the relationship between institutions and political culture, between formal law and soft law. Uh, and in many countries uh, today, what we see going on is what some people have described as authoritarian constitutionalism, by which they mean uh, governments that don't go outside the law to try to capture more and more control of the state, uh, but that work within legal forms uh, to do the same thing. Um, and in that context, it seems to me all the more important to focus on the soft norms or the cultural understandings that can stand in the way of that kind of process. Uh, so I'm curious uh, to hear some perspective on what are the sources of political culture in Turkey uh, that uh, are robust, uh, that can be mobilized? Uh, you know, what is the political culture of the country like with respect to the kinds of issues that have been discussed here? What kinds of changes, if any, can you point to in that sphere? Surely it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, however, I may say in a general sort of way that uh, a large part of the Turkish public appreciates the importance of the rule of law. Uh, we frequently use the phrase among ourselves, uh, everybody needs law or law is in the benefit of everybody. Sometimes politicians uh, deviate from this rule. Uh, they respect law only so long as it serves their interest. However, there is a general feeling uh, in the country at large, the population at large, that uh, what Turkey needs is a, a more solid system of the rule of law. Without uh, detailed studies on the political and legal culture and popular attitudes towards these questions, uh, this is, uh, as much as I can say, uh, I cannot say a definite answer. Uh, however, a drift towards majoritarianism, as I mentioned, uh, would be resisted by perhaps not the overwhelming majority of the country, but uh, by uh, reasonably uh, large part of the population uh, would find this drift as uh, dangerous, and undesirable. And can you speak to the issue Professor Fallon raised about trust and competition between political forces uh, and the, the need for political forces to internalize some set of long-term perspective on institutions uh, uh, rather than you know, being so dominated by their political self-interest of the moment? I mean, what does that, I, my, my perception is that's been fraying a great deal in recent years in Turkey. I, I am afraid my answer to the question uh, relating to trust is close to zero. Uh, this is one of the most uh, uh, undesirable aspects of the current Turkish politics. Uh, there is a very sharp polarization between the government party and the opposition parties, a complete lack of trust. Uh, I'm glad you uh, uh, brought the issue of trust uh, to our discussion, uh, because for a healthy democracy, you need a minimum of uh, trust among the uh, main political actors. Uh, a trust into e each other's intentions about the, the uh, affairs of the system, the structure of the system. Uh, Today, uh, perhaps uh, at the root of the political uh, crisis is the lack of trust. 
uh, more than uh, the substance of policies. Of course, the substance of policies are important, but uh, uh, the main uh, uh, instrument of polarization is psychological. Uh, it can be summed up as the lack of trust. Uh, Professor Fallon, uh, do you have any deeper or further insights into what uh, political majorities and political minorities both uh, can do to create or recreate or sustain some kind of trust in, in the democratic process, essentially. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the notion that there are fair ground rules of political competition. I hope that's not a nefarious force which turned off my mic. Uh, <laughs> um, that there are fair ground rules of political competition, that they'll be honored by, by groups in power and out of power, that there will be a fair chance that the opposition will one day have political power, that those in the government will one day be out of power, and so have to look at the issue from that perspective, as you talked about. Um, what builds up that sense or recreates that sense if it's framed? Uh, of, of trust between opposing political forces that at the very bottom, as you described, you know, is what's necessary to underwrite a thick rule of law kind of regime? I think you've asked exactly the right question of exactly the wrong person. <laughs> uh, th that is, uh, to, I could talk in a very generic way uh, in response to that question, but I can't obviously, I think, speak in a specific way because I just don't possess the requisite uh, local knowledge. I think in a very general way, I would start by uh, looking simultaneously at the two schools of political theorists that I uh, invoked in talking about the ways that uh, the conditions of a stable, attractive uh, political democracy can arise and sustain themselves. Um, one group emphasizes individual self-interest as crucial to buy in to the system and insists that groups who think that they have been victimized by overreach at the hands of another group uh, have to assert themselves and exert a kind of checking function, uh, because if they don't, they will come to be viewed as patsies who will be walked over repeatedly in the future. So political scientists often talk uh, about stable political constitutions as being self-enforcing. If there's a violation, there will be some uh, force in the society that will rise up uh, to enforce the Constitution. On the other hand, I think it is absolutely crucial that action not lead to excessive reaction in a way that is destructive of trust. And I think to the greatest possible uh, extent, uh, assertion ought not to be accompanied by the kind of name calling uh, that poisons any possibility of fruitful political cooperation uh, going forward. And so I think for people to be successful in politics uh, in this kind of a situation uh, requires truly extraordinary capacities that I don't claim to possess, but there are people who have uh, it uh, that involves a mix of firmness, restraint in not going too uh, far, and generosity, sometimes even magnanimity uh, toward one's opponents as a means of building a basis of trust for going forward. Let me ask if any of the panelists want to ask a question of any of the other panelists, and then we'll open it up to the audience. I was just going to add to Professor Fallon's um, answer. I mean, in, in many ways, one of the puzzles of American politics has been the question of trust with regard to African Americans in the wake of their treatment um, in Jim Crow South, and figuring out uh, how to deal with a problem of deep distrust that manifested itself in people simply unwilling to vote for a candidate of the other race. And as time has gone on, some solutions have emerged. Most of them are political, and they're, they're less um, uh, 
in some ways less grand than Professor Fallon's suggestion, a little bit more um, about down and dirty politics, but they involved creating cross-cutting alliances so that the only, the only categories weren't black and white, but Democrat and Republican, uh, different representatives. Um, th these kinds of cross-cutting alliances help to foster repeat, con con uh, repeat connections between people, foster different kinds of alliances, which reduce the stakes of the central concern. And the second piece of it was giving people a stake in the system. Uh, so that when you feel like you have a stake in the system, you are often much more willing to trust it and understand yourself to be part of it. One story, for example, of uh, the way that white ethnics were integrated uh, into the United States, despite heavy discrimination against them, was that they were pulled into politics. Uh, and as they were pulled into politics, they were pulled into power sharing. Uh, and so power sharing was a means by which people lost the identity that was causing them to not be trustful, um, and began to just understand themselves as part of the warp and woof of politics. And so sometimes politics is the problem, but sometimes it can also be the solution to these, these sorts of issues. If I could throw in just one last uh, example. I think in the late 20th, early 21st centuries, the heroic towering uh, statesperson on the world stage by nearly universal acclaim uh, has been Nelson Mandela. And if you think about Nelson uh, Mandela, it was firmness in terms of rule of law. It was willingness to disobey the written law uh, when the written, when disobedience of the written law uh, was what was called uh, for. It was trust building uh, with former enemies to try to establish a stable regime of trust and restraint and reasonableness uh, for going forward and not Every situation requires uh, a Nelson Mandela. Not every country is going to be blessed with a Nelson Mandela, but I think the range of political virtues that uh, it takes to move from a bad place to a good place uh, can be very broad. Your comment there reminds me of uh, one of the greatest speeches in American political history was the speech that our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, gave when he was elected to office for the second time uh, as our civil war was coming to an end. Uh, and even in the aftermath of one of the bloodiest civil wars uh, in history, and certainly the bloodiest war the United States has ever been a part of, uh, over 600,000 people being killed, um, he managed to define the future with this phrase that's very well known to us in the United States, with malice towards none, with charity towards all, which is a remarkable statement, you know, for a victor uh, in a civil war uh, to utter. And he followed that with the phrase, um, with confidence in the right as God gives us to see the right, signaling that it was not just malice toward uh, none and charity toward all, but a firmness of vision of where justice uh, lay and the humility about knowing exactly what uh, that vision entailed that led him to append uh, as God gives us to see the right. I want to uh, make this final remark in closing and then open it up. Uh, the Council General from the United States uh, made reference to this, and some of us have made reference to this in our comments. I think people from outside the United States often think of our political history uh, as a very, like, sort of happy, progressive story uh, of robust separation of powers, strong independent courts, strong First Amendment traditions or protections for political freedoms. Uh, but the reality is that those uh, virtues, those institutions, uh, were built up over a very long period of time and struggle. Uh, it's not as if they were born intact simply when our Constitution was created. Uh, I mentioned one very important moment in our history of struggle between the President and the Supreme Court for judicial independence. Um, and I, myself, am a deep believer in the contingency of history. 
uh, that there are moments that are highly decisive and significant uh, in the political and legal development of countries that can send things down one path or another path. Um, and these histories are not simple, happy stories, even in successful countries that have had long-standing democracies. They involve lots of struggles, lots of difficult moments, uh, lots of moments of uh, concern about the fate of these institutions. Uh, so that's one perspective from at least our experience that I wanted to make sure to convey. Uh, thank you very much again for all of you to being here and for those who put together this remarkable event. Uh, and we'll bring it to a close now so that you can get to lunch and we have time for the panels this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.